This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast Show. Wait, hold. 67. Yes, we're in show 67. Welcome to We the S East Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. Ramsey hates, I mean, loves doing the dishes because it helps him think about new ideas. Hope you enjoy the show. Marhaba, SE Nation. I guess my Lebanese heritage is finally out. Hello, everybody. I am your host. My name is Ramzi Marjaba. And when I'm not speaking to awesome people on this platform, I'm a sales engineer out of sunny Ottawa, Canada. And I can't believe I wrote that. And my goal is to build the most awesomest SE community where we can all learn and grow together. Now, you can help me with that. And how, you wonder? Well, by simply going to your podcast platform of choice and leaving this show an honest rating and review. Honest because I want to get better for you. And this sounds a lot like a commercial, but it's not. I actually need that from you. I need your help. More people will find us that way. Our community will grow and we will all be able to help each other. Now, to our guest of the evening or the morning, depending when you're listening, my guest today or our guest, his name is Greg Dickinson. He's the founder and CEO of Omidim, which is a software which helps customers find specific parts of a demo video by searching keywords. So you don't have to uh, scroll into a video anymore. You just, you search, you find it. Now, this is not a sponsored segment, although I wouldn't hold it against anybody who would want to sponsor the show. But the reason I wanted Greg on is because he was an SE uh, a while back, and I wanted to pick his brain on how an SE can turn into a CEO. We all think that we're that there might not be a move after being a sales engineer. It, it could be a lateral move to marketing, or you have to go up to uh, sales management, SE management, or a lateral move to sales engineer uh, to sorry sales representative to a salesperson but hey you can be your the ceo of your own company and this was an interesting story for story for me i enjoyed talking to greg and i hope you enjoy hearing our conversation show notes are at we the sales engineers.com slash show 67 and without further ado here's greg good morning greg how are you doing today outstanding how about yourself i am outstanding as well uh Thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy person who owns his own business, if I said that correctly, or the CEO of a company. But I wanted to bring you on because I think you would bring a lot of value to the SE nation that I serve. Um, yeah, good. Great to be here. We're all busy. and uh, But at the end of the day, right, we learn from others. So I'm always willing to participate because I get a lot back from listening to other people you know, talk, talk about their day or their job or their, their business. So it goes both ways. So not a problem at all. Glad to be here. Well, thank you. And I like that. All right. So let's get started the way I usually get started by ha- having you introduce yourself to my uh, listeners and we'll go from there. Okay. So my name is Greg Dickinson. I am currently the CEO of a company called Amadim. Uh, not that difficult. My demo spelled backwards and we're really focused on what we call digital buyer enablement. And, and, and really it's all about how do we get that product in the hands of your digital buyers today uh, much sooner and in a kind of a digital format as opposed to the, to the traditional analog uh, way. Um, I'm going to walk through a little bit of, of, of how I got to where I am today. Well, I'm assuming that you weren't born a CEO of a company. You started somewhere else. So maybe we can go through your history just so people can understand how you got to where you are. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So um, I, I was in the United States Air Force and I got out of the Air Force in 1991 and went to work for a, uh, a, a company uh, called Dun & Bradstreet PC Net, uh, computer science degree, and uh, started off you know, basically in the help desk. But then I immediately got into this idea of, of software development and, and, and became the, the showman, if you will. I, I was the chosen one to go out every time we were going to do a demo about our e-commerce software that we were using to help people buy our, you know, kind of our, our computers and so forth. Um, I was the one and I fell in love with it. I, you know, became really, really passionate about the fact that, you know, people need to understand your software and what can it do. So when I, I, I joined Ariba uh, in 1997, 
Um, I was living on the East Coast. I was the first one they hired outside of California. And again, I was in the pre-sales role. And there I was you know, kind of uh, starting off demoing, you know, gosh, one of the best applications I've had the pleasure of, of showing. And so that led through a different career. I, I, pre-sales, I ended up running pre-sales. Then I moved into sales operations um, and eventually kind of ended up running sales uh, for North America. So graduated from, you know, from pre-sales into uh, sales. And then I did a stint. After that, on uh, three other startups, um, and I think you know what what really was beneficial to me was the fact that after you know spending a number of years in the pre-sales uh, role, when you're you know part of a startup, whether you're the CEO or anybody else, right? You, you're the one that gives all the demos. You don't have the bandwidth to hire you know great talented pre-sales engineers. You end up doing a lot of that uh, presentation, and I and I think the demo you know, is very important to the buying process. I think if you look at buyers, they'll tell you it's the most important thing. Um, and so, you know, that kind of three more, you know, gigs at that. And then um, started this, this company called Amadim. And really it was kind of, how do I bring together my, my um, experience in, in, in pre-sales and maybe some of the, some of the areas I felt pre-sales was not being leveraged to the best of their ability at the same time, you know, kind of trying to think about this notion of, of how can we help a buyer engage much more meaningfully in, in, with the product. And so that's where I kind of came up with this new technology uh, that enables that to be done. Some follow-up questions. Uh, why did you fall in love with showing the products to customers? I, I just thought it was a, a, a great opportunity, right? You can, um, you know, uh, I, I'm not a reader as much as I am a, a, a you know, talker. So I think I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to sit in front of a, you know, back in the, you know, 1997, every meeting was done face to face, right? There was, there, there was no such thing as a WebEx or a go to meeting or a Zoom. It was all, you know, in, in their uh, boardrooms. And I just found that to be a lot of fun, right? You've got a, a, a group of people, one, two, three, 10, 20. Uh, they all come at you from a different angle. They have a different perspective of what's important to them with this quote unquote solution you're trying to sell to them or to, to help them understand. And I just, you know, fast on your feet and being able to utilize the product to answer someone's question and show them. And, and gosh, to be honest with you, the best part is when a smile you know, comes on their face and they get it and they're like, wow, that's really cool. And you can, you can begin to see the questions move from, you know, the, the, the can to the how, and then the when, right. When we implement, when we do this, it's just, I don't know, it's theatrics. I guess maybe I want to be an actor, but I just really truly enjoy that, that camaraderie and that, and that environment where you're, um, you know, presenting your software, uh, to a group of people that have that have a varying degree of interest, and gosh, it's your job to uh, make sure you convey the proper messages and 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 show them right how the software can solve their problem. It's not a training exercise; it's a more of a, of a show me how your software can solve or take away a pain or give me you know give me pleasure in something I'm trying to get done in my in, in my job. And that's fun. It's that aha moment, right? Like where you can see it in their face that they get it, they get how this could help them. I have the same feeling all the time, or at least when yeah. I do it right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So here's another follow-up question. How have you found WebEx, Zoom, or GoToMeeting affect the sales process negatively or positively? Do you think it added more value or reduced the value of sales engineering? Um, I don't think it has a, you know, I, I think overall it has an impact on, the the role of a, 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 a pre-sales because you can't read the audience right I mean you, you really let's be honest if we are honest you don't know what the other person is doing at the other end right and we and and, and if you think of yourself when you're on something how, how many times do you, does your phone beep and you grab it how many times does a you know little you know Skype or something pop up on your screen and you and, you, and your your attention is diverted so I think from that perspective if all things being equal. I would much rather be in the environment where I was going to meetings face to face, but you know, Zoom is it, it, and, and WebEx is et cetera are here to stay. Um, you know, I learned at my last startup. Um, you know, I, I always used to say I, I was the CEO of that company, and I always just say, "Listen, we're going to do all of our meetings, you know, kind of face to face." And you know, I, I remember flying out to Phoenix to visit with a, a, a large uh, company, and. There was only two people in the room there. And I'm like, gosh, I thought you guys said there was 11. Well, yeah, but Greg, we're, we're not in one building, right? We're all over the place. So, you know, it just kind of realization that, 
even if you want to, it's really not possible because of a distributed uh, workforce. So I think what that really means is you have to be, you know, kind of on your game to really um, slow down. Um, you gotta, you gotta pace yourself better because you, you, it's sometimes difficult with those technologies to hear the question. And if you're talking a mile a minute, right. And we all are guilty of it. I'm raising my hand right now. You can't see it, but you know, if we get, you know, excited and we want to finish what we're talking about and, and we miss that person that's trying to interrupt us with a question, gosh, that's a bad experience for them. So you got to put yourself in their shoes, um, in, in that environment. So, you know, I think it's a, it's, to me, it's not as, it, it, it would be better to be face to face, but that's just not, you know, that's wishing for something is not going to happen. So I think you need to adapt your skills and therefore I don't think it's a detriment to the pre-sales uh, role, right? Um, I think because what you need to do, you know, is, is adapt yourself. It's kind of like um, if you've ever been a manager of a remote team, you need to manage that team a little differently than if you were all in the same building and you could have your staff meeting, you know, your stand up every day face to face. So, you know, that's kind of a long answer to a, to a good question. Oh, well, it was a good answer, if I may say so myself. Uh, all right. Sales operations. Could you define that a little bit for the listeners? Yeah. So, you know, we had a, a large sales force at, at, at Ariba and we had an SVP of, of worldwide sales. And, and you look at all the mechanics that go into uh, how do you ensure that the sales team is is as productive as possible, right? So you kind of have, you know, uh, there's a role there around uh, forecasting and and your sales force, you know, whether you're using Salesforce or other other tools, right? How do you get all that? into one place, the sales process, right? Is your team uh, all following the same process? You know, where does, you know, kind of part three, what members of the team uh, need to be, need some help, need some training, need some coaching, need some mentoring, you know, how, however that may be. And then it's a real good uh, starting, you know, back, you know, gosh, we started this in, I started this in 2000 is, is being able to look at the data and, and, and kind of try to find some, uh, success, right? And, and, oh, look, this process over here yielded a better result than uh, this process over here. Now, today, that's a heck of a lot easier because we just we're overwhelmed with data and analytics is, you know, it, it is like, you know, uh, re what reporting used to be. So, but that was really my role is to report to that SVP and, 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 and ensure that, you know, his job was to make the number. His job was to, 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 to get the growth we wanted. And my job was to make him successful, right, in that role and, and making sure that all the little, you know, things that need to happen to a, you know, large sales force do happen uh, and, and, and continue to make that sales force as productive as possible. So you were saying SEP or SVP? No, no, the, 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 I worked for an SDP. Uh, what's SDP? I, know, I think I mu you must have just misheard me, SDP. Yeah. Uh, no, SV as in Victor, Senior Vice yes, President. Okay, that's okay. okay uh, that's sorry. what I thought. No, no, it's yeah. all good. I, I misheard. Uh, so being a person who was a sales engineer, went into sales operation and then into sales, a lot of the comments that I hear from sales engineers and salespeople is that whatever uh, process the sales operations come with, do not make them more efficient, actually slows them down which is counterintuitive to uh, what their purpose is. So could you explain how it could actually increase the performance of a salesperson or an SE? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so listen, I don't think they're wrong, right? I think that, that if the purpose of the quote-unquote process is not in the best interest of the salesperson, what I mean by that is if you put in this onerous amount of, of process in place because you want this result from a management or operation perspective, then yes, a hundred percent, it can, you know, kind of impact the performance of a sales team. But on the other hand, right, if you're putting the, if you're listening to salespeople on, on, on where um, they're challenged, where, you know, maybe they don't have enough, uh, enough of information they need to get for marketing. Maybe they're not getting the right messaging. Maybe they, you know, they believe they don't have the right, the right tools um, you know, and, and, and so forth, right, or the right process, and they're, and they're, and they're missing these steps. Um, I think the, the idea is to provide them with, uh, you know, a framework that, you know, we can begin to show them results. And, and it's, it, it can be done incorrectly. I'm not saying it can't, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure I've done things incorrectly in that, in that realm. But the goal really is to understand, you know, from a salesperson's perspective, um, 
and, and then to, to, to kind of also work with them to say, listen, you know, I know you want to be a hundred percent on your own and do whatever you want, but that, that doesn't work for you ultimately, right? You can learn from others. You can learn from a process. And by the way, it really doesn't uh, suit the company. Well, if we have no visibility into what anyone is doing and we just hope and pray at the end of the quarter, things happen the way we want that, you know, you get, better results from, you know, so oftentimes you get what you inspect, not what you expect. So I, I think there's a, there's a middle ground that you can help um, everyone. And, and, you know, listen, even major league baseball players or the PGA golfers or, you know, the United States soccer teams have a coach and there's a process they have to follow. And why? Because if you're doing something as a team, you need to have a process that the team follows, right? Selling is a team sport. It involves sales and marketing and pre-sales and maybe a tech, uh, you know, a solution architect, et cetera. Um, that, I think, requires a little bit of structure. And I think it's, it's kind of uh, goes both ways, right? It's a little bit ludicrous to suggest no structure. I'd be the most productive salesperson ever. And I think it's ludicrous for, you know, for sales operations to come in and say, hey, listen, here's the 12-step process. You can't vary. You can't move a muscle. You got to do everything exactly in the cadence we tell you to do. This is our new X, Y, and Z, and expect that to be productive as well. Um, you know, it, I think it's common sense that both teams need to work together. They have a common goal after all. After all. Yeah, I agree. This has happened so many times to me. Like right now, uh, the CRMs out there that were used for sales operations are so much better and so much easier than they used to be that it actually is a collaborative tool where a colleague of mine, an SE went on vacation and then I had to do a demo in his place, but I had no idea what he was doing because everything was on his notebook and I had no idea what they wanted. So I had to do a discovery all over again. So having, having the information in a common place uh, like that, I found that very useful. So I, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. Yeah, and I think you know when when when, when look date back to you know to Siebel right in the '90s. Let's be honest: the reason that CRM was put in place first and foremost was to give management visibility into forecasts and pipeline. Right? That that's and and I think it took a while before you know a lot of CRM implementations failed, and the reason they failed is because sales wasn't using the solution. And so finally someone woke up one day and said, well, gosh, what would, you know, what would convince Greg to use a solution? What could I put in the solution that would make Greg's life and job easier? And then we get the benefit of this visibility and this forecasting, you know, accuracy. And I think that's where the, to your point you just made, you know, the transitions come full circle where, gosh, now I use them every day and I couldn't live without them because I, I need that. Gosh, I need the discipline. I need the tracking. I need the reminders. I need the data. My team needs data. I I, I find it very frustrating when you know when 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 uh, you know you you have a conversation with a prospect and then for whatever reason so when, you know you're, let's pretend you're the um, inside salesperson. You have a conversation with somebody. I hear this story all the time. It it, it really boils back to our solution help. But um, you know, you have a conversation as an inside salesperson, and then you get promoted to talk to the salesperson and the salesperson starts all over again with the same exact questions. That's really adding friction, right? To the buying process. And there's a reason why Gartner said the research said that 77% of all buyers are, are, are saying that the buying process is complex, hard, difficult, and frustrating. And that means something because today in our world, you can't get two people to agree on anything. Get 77% of people to agree on something, that means it's a big problem, right? And it goes to your point of, of that redundancy, that do-over. Nice. So you've been through pretty much a lot of roles in sales, you, as, uh, from software developer to SE to uh, sales operations to sales, then sales leader. And what, made, what prompted you go, to go from sales leader to owning your own companies? Well, just fortune, I guess. So I had the opportunity. I worked for uh, a lot of great, great people at Ariba, um, and uh, I'm, I, I did pretty well there. And so, you know, when those people that were my boss at the time moved on to other roles, um, you know, one of them gave me my first shot at a company out of, uh, out of Salt Lake City um, as the EVP of sales um, and marketing, et cetera. And then, um, you know, they promoted me to CEO. So that was my first, you know, kind of opportunity um, in, in, in that chair. Um, and then, you know, uh, I started Hyperos, a, a, a person, again, I had worked with when I was at Ariba, you know, came to me and said, Hey, I got this idea. Um, do you think it could be a software product? Right. And kind of, that was really 
uh, beneficial to me because I could kind of put all my hats together, software engineering hat, um, the notion of pre-sale selling and then kind of leadership and how does that, you know, package up. So I, you know, kind of looked at it and to be honest, I said no three times because I really didn't think it was a, uh, it was a market. Um, but it ended up, uh, she convinced me and, uh, you know, started the business with her. And then that was my last startup called Hyperos uh, that, you know, ran for seven and a half years until we uh, uh, sold to, uh, to private equity. So we could add on and bolt on other um, companies to, to kind of in increase the size of the, of the offering and the footprint. So that's kind of the, you know, I, 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 I um, was able to get um, into a, into an, a position that allowed me to, uh, you know, to take the reins. And then from, once I got, you know, got that job, got that experience, it led to other experiences. Um, I think that, you know, the, the one lesson is that, um, and I say this, you know, I have kids and I say this to my children all the time, but you know, it, you, you can't uh, be afraid uh, to take that, you know, that chance. And, and I, you know, I just talking to someone the other day and said, you know, you, if you, you know, there's that saying and it, it, people cliche, people think it is, but you miss a thousand shots you don't take. Right. And, and that's so true though, because if you're given a position, if you're an SC and, you're, and they ask you to come be a team leader, ask you to be a manager and you're like, gosh, if I, if I, if I, if I don't do it right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in trouble or I'm going to, you know, it's going to ruin my career. But guess what? If you don't take it and you wanted to, you, you, you kind of not giving your shot, yourself that shot. So I think it's about, you know, having confidence in yourself, having a good, strong network, always, always find good mentors. I've, you know, I've got three or four right now. I count on all the time, right? Ha, ha, what about this? What about that? What about this? So, you know, I think that's, you know, what I did. And, 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 and again, you know, I believe um, as I learned uh, very strongly at Ariba from Keith Kroc, the CEO that, you know, uh, he or she that has the best team wins. And so everything I've always done, whether it was pre-sales, sales operations, uh, CEO, I surround myself with people that are much smarter than I am. And, and, and they always complement all my weaknesses. And that, that means I need a big team, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So how did you find your mentors? I've worked with him, right? So I've worked with Keith Kroc and he, he he's a, a great mentor. I went up my, my first original boss at, uh, at, at PC net Camilo Soto was, you know, just a, a inspirational entrepreneur that, you know, has just become uber successful and uh, stayed in touch with him over the years. And, you know, I can go to him for, you know, for help. And I've got, you know, other people that I've worked with, um, you know, at, at Ariba that were either my peers, my boss, and, you know, and I, I just, um, you know, stay in touch and I'm not afraid to, you know, cause I have that relationship. I'm not afraid to go and say, I'm struggling with this. I don't understand this. Or, hey, let me walk you through a scenario. How would you, how would you view that? Because regardless of what job you're in, right? If you're, you know, let's take the CEO role. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I don't, if I ask my board too many questions, they're going to lose confidence, you know, in what I'm doing. If I ask my team too many questions, they're going to be wondering, am I the right leader? And, you know, if you're running pre-sales or you're in pre-sales and you're constantly asking your salesperson, then gosh, do they have the confidence in you that, that you want. So having that mentor, that, that, that person you can trust and confide in and know that if you open up, you know, and, and, and go to them and say, gosh, I'm really struggling with this or, Hey, can we, can I give you a demo? Can you be critical of me of where I'm not communicating effectively? Cause I, you know, I used to do it in front of a video constantly, right? I used to videotape myself, not for vanity, but to, to, to listen to Greg and see how to come across and, 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 and did I come across correctly? And I think, you know, that no matter what role you're in, you can leverage those mentors. Um, and, and you'd be surprised people, you know, I, gosh, you know, I, I give as much time as I can to other people because I, I, I ask for it in return. So you didn't go out and say, Hey, will you be my mentor? You developed that relationship organically and you just like, he could be your mentor. And then sometimes he could ask you questions and you could be his mentor. So it's a two way street. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, an example of Camillo, I mean, I, you know, we, we've done business together and there's times when he I'm thinking about doing this, you're the software expert. Um, cause that's what all I've ever done in my whole career. Um, gosh, you know, I, I would go about doing this. And then, you know, two months later, I'm saying, gosh, I'm, I'm looking at this pricing model and, you know, and, and, you know, send it to me, Greg, let me look at it. Right. And, and, and it's just, you know, I think that's, it's, it's a friendship as much as it is, you know, trust. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah. That's, that, that's what it is. So here's a story about my career. Uh, I joined uh, my former company as a sales engineer for the first time in my life. 
being a sales engineer and within and they assigned a mentor for me within two months he quit and went somewhere else and i i was talking to my manager it's like hey i don't have a mentor anymore should i get a mentor and he's like do you need a mentor i'm like eh, no and i, I kind of regretted that ever, ever, ever <laughs> since the words came out of my mouth because i feel like you always need a mentor maybe not specifically as a sales engineer uh, like the mentor doesn't have to be another sales engineer it could be some like in finance or somewhere but mentors are a good thing to have no matter where you are in your career track and i love that the ceo has mentors and colleagues that he can collaborate with them yeah, yeah absolutely now, listen my son just graduated graduated from college last year he's got his first job and you know, I, I, there, I, you know, I know someone in the town he's, he's working in that's, you know, kind of successful at their business. And I, I called him up and said, Hey, listen, you know, my, my son is here. He's got a, you know, he's an inside salesperson for this company. Would you mind once a quarter, just grabbing lunch? I'll pick the tab up just, you know, once a lot, once a quarter, just listen to him. Right. I mean, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know about it. I don't want anything to do with it, but gosh, would you mind doing that? And, and, and they did, right? And my son was like, holy mackerel, that guy's so smart. He knows so much stuff. And he's, he's been that far. And, I'm, you know, and, of course, it's not his dad, right, telling him all these things. It's someone else. You know? and, and I just think for him to understand what tomorrow may hold or next year or next week or five years down the path, to your point, right, you became a new SE. You were doing a really good job. But did you have someone that could say, hey, don't think, don't forget about the finance side of the equation. Hey, don't forget about the sales side of the equation. Hey, you know, wh what are you doing to sharpen your ax, as I always say? What are you doing to make your skills better every day? Are you learning something? Are you practicing something? You're doing something. A mentor can sometimes point that out and ask those hard questions that, you know, your boss may not, right? It's it just, you know, your boss has a different agenda than your mentor does. So, yeah, I'm with you a thousand percent. Don't, you know, it's not. Uh, embarrassing it's not a sign of weakness it's actually i think it's a sign of brilliance that you that you're willing to admit i don't have all the answers i haven't been down every path in the world so someone else may be able to help me well it's a cliche but the more you know the more you know that you don't know stuff actually i didn't say that correctly at all but you get the gist of it uh so i wanted to ask you between being a sales engineer and a ceo are there any similarities Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, so the number one, you know, the number one skill, right, of, of, a, of a sales engineer is to hear a problem, hear a challenge, hear a question, and be able to articulate a solution and answer, right? Isn't that what we do all day, right? But, yeah. you know, again, I, and, I, and I, I, you know, I think the, 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 generic show up and throw up overview demo is not what I'm referring to. That's just a you know robotic. I'm just going to give the same demo over and over and over again. I'm talking about, you know, it's you're, you're on demo two, three or four and it's heavily scripted. The, the prospect has, has outlined for you. Here's our scripts. Here's our challenges. And gosh, that's not your world, right? You don't understand every single aspect of the farm or financial services or manufacturing or whatever it may be. And you have to be able to understand that, take it in very quickly and react. Well, gosh, that's what a CEO does. I, I, I have to talk to the different people in my organization, uh, listen, listen, and understand their perspective. Why are they asking that question? Is what they're saying um, and being able to come back to them with, hey, have, you, have we thought about this? Or we thought about that? Or, hey, this is maybe one way I would attack that. And, you know, although it's not, software is not the solution, Overall, it's the same kind of, and that's why, you know, gosh, I think there's a natural transition because, you know, my, my kind of my computer science background was solving problems, right? Ones and zeros. It wasn't English where I was, you know, uh, right. And it could be interpreted. It either worked or it didn't work, right? The software yep. either worked or doesn't work. And I think that's the mindset I have as a, you know, as a leader of, of, of Amadim. And again, you know, I'm, I'm just the leader. I'm the guy in the boat yelling stroke because my team is doing all the work, right? They're the ones doing everything necessary to propel this company forward. So speaking of Amadim, how did the idea come about? So um, I, I, I saw my last business. I moved to South Carolina. I was looking for, uh, you know, something else, right? Because I just was, was, was frankly bored and, and missed collaboration, missed people, missed customers. Um, and I was doing, I was helping out a bunch of friends that were, you know, in companies, leading companies, et cetera, on, you know, SaaS and sales and, you know, kind of what, what I was seeing in the market. And 
and, and a lot of it was Greg, you know, gosh, our, our demos really aren't that good. Could you help the demo team? That's kind of where you, you know, where you, you, you cut your chops, et cetera. So that was happening. And, and then at the same time, my two sons came home for Thanksgiving and they said, dad, we take these online classes. They're 90 minutes long They're for 14 weeks. It's now time for final exams. We want to study. And as the father, my, you know, my ears went up immediately study. Oh, this is great news, right? I want to, how can I help you study? And I said, well, why can't you just go back and, you know, let's pretend the subject is gross margin calculation. Why can't you just go back and search and find that section? Like, no, dad, like how do you search a video? All you can search is the title, the tags, you know, then you, you don't know which week it was talked about. You don't know which minute of the day it was talked about during the lecture. And that problem kind of resonated with me. I'm like, wait a minute. If the top of the funnel demo is a repeat over and over and over again, it's kind of not engaging for a pre-sales engineer. It's not um, at all times useful for the prospect because they get the same thing and it may not be what they're really interested in. Is there a way I could take that technology, that idea of being able to search inside of video, inside of a video to find the exact two minute, three minute or five minutes in which that topic was being demoed and a prospect could see it and hear it, which is, you know, we learn better nine times better that way than we do by reading something. So that's kind of where the idea came from. I, 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 I kind of was all we heard trying to solve and help a, a you know, a, a business uh, with, with their demo and, 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 and kind of engagement process and cost of sale. And then, you know, my kids asked me this question and um, I, I went out and looked and nobody was doing it. Right. I, I not one company, that I found, I spent six months and hired two uh, grad students at Clemson University to go out and do research for me, and no one had done it yet, had searched inside the video. So I, you know, I, 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 after I, that, I'm like, well, maybe it's because it can't be done. So I, I next hired some grad students to go develop a prototype, take a, a video off of YouTube, inject it into a process, and then could I ask a question and would it find the right section? And they built the prototype, it was rude, but it, they built it, it worked, and so that's, we launched, um, you know, kind of honored them for that reason, right? Is to how do we help a buyer, a prospect, a visitor, whatever you want to call it, learn about your company via searching the, you know, the, the, the video itself, the MP4, not the tags or the keywords, which oftentimes lead us astray. So if I get this straight, like from, if you just pull the YouTube video out and you apply this, that means for your customers, there isn't, there isn't any additional work that they need to do other than record the video and most likely upload it to uh, uh, Omidim. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So just you know, yesterday I had a, a, a prospect went to our website, took their own demo with my technology, called me and said, hey, you know, we, we'd like to see if it works with our stuff. I said, great. I went to their YouTube channel. I pulled down five videos, uploaded in the platform, and a half, you know, it processed automatically. It automatically created... Uh, the index so that you know, there's a natural language processing engine on top of it. I, th it also creates phrases so it knows parallel workflow, analytics, credit card processing, whatever those key terms are you talked about. That's because some prospects want to search. Some like to browse, right? So you've got different people find information differently. So I, and within like two hours, I, I sent her a, an email and said, here it is, right? It's, 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 she's like, holy, already? I said, yeah, I just grabbed six of your you know, you're, 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 by the way, they're a year and a half old on YouTube, which is one of the detriments of using, you know, kind of YouTube, your customers are seeing old stuff that you didn't, uh, you know, didn't refresh, didn't take the time to get rid of, but yeah, lo and behold, um, uh, you know, they, they were able to then use that if they wanted to right away on their, on their, off their website, remove the request a demo button and let a prospect start now. Or, you know, we've got inside salespeople that, you know, let's say I have you on the phone. Um, I'm not a, huge fan or proponent of inside sales giving demos. That's not why you hired them, right? You hired yeah. them to prospect. Um, you hired them to, to sell, not to demo. And I think the results that we're finding in, in, in companies doing research that 60, 70, 80% of prospects that get the demo from the inside salesperson are, are not finding that beneficial. They're not walking away wild. So I think actually it could be detrimental to your business. If it's done poorly, you, you lost that buyer for good. So uh, we see a lot of our customers starting to use our technology in place of that. Um, and then you know, we capture all the data, all the activity, all the questions, all the topics that were viewed. So that now when your sales team does engage with the pre-sales engineer, I know everything they're interested in. I'm, I can have a very 
focused conversation around, I noticed you were trying to solve this problem or that problem, or you're interested in this functionality. Um, and it's a much more meaningful conversation, but we make it as simple as possible for our prospects, our customers to move from an analog world to a digital world. And who's the target market? Is it like marketing people or sales engineers? Who, who was the best person to jump on your website and start playing around? Yeah, so we, we have all, all, all the above, right? So we've got uh, companies that are really uh, bothered by the fact that the requested demo process, the bounce rate when that form pops up is 85%. Not my data, HubSpot data, 85%, which means that 85% of all potential buyers, potential, are abandoning you and going somewhere else. So marketing worries about that. Geez, my, how can I open up, right, my website to, ha to capture more leads? And then on the, on the sales side, right, we have, we have customers that are, I want, I want sales is going to be interacting with the prospect more. I want, I want them to utilize this as a, as a vehicle, as a tool, um, demand gen inside sales. Uh, and then, you know, last but not least, we've got, you know, pre-sales engineers that, uh, find themselves a they want to create better content for the company so they're advocating hey well, why don't we get the best and brightest to create our demos they're more consistent they're professional they're available 24 7 let's use this technology to help that part of the business and then selfishly as a pre-sales engineer you know and i know you give a lot of demos that are 60 minutes 90 minutes long their latter part of the sales cycle they're very scripted and the, and inevitably 90 some odd percent of the time the prospect will call you up and say, great demo, thanks. These two people were missing. We need yes. to redo it. But they're executives, so you can't do the 90-minute demo again. So is there any way like we can, you know, can, can bring, boil that down to five minutes? And, 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 and what they use our technology for is they just send them the full 90 minutes recorded. The executive can see every question that the, that the buying team asked during that 90-minute call. And it can go to any topics they're interested in. The executive's not going to sit through 90 minutes, but if they ask two, three, four, five questions, listen to the answer that two or three other people asked, they're done in 10 minutes. And they check the box, perfect, keep moving forward. I love what I saw, right? That's how pre-sales likes to use our software. Yeah. Before, before we move on, I do want to point out that this is not a sponsored segment. This is because I'm genu genuinely interested and I think it solves a problem that sales engineers have. So if someone wants to try this out, uh, like omadim.com or how yep. does it work? Yeah, omadim.com. Everything, you know, obviously we eat our own dog food. Our, our, our demos are right there. Just demo, ask whatever questions you want, see how, it's, how, how it works, what it does. We don't hide anything. It's like, you know, we've automated the whole trial process by, you know, letting you drive your own experience. And then when you're, uh, you know, appreciate you asking. And then when you're interested, um, you, know, get, you know, give me a call, look me up at LinkedIn. Uh, you know, uh, hit, hit the contact info button on, on Amadim.com and uh, we'll have a conversation. I'm interested and passionate about this topic. I know emphatically, like I, I'm not saying I'm going to be the 800 pound gorilla in this space. I'm, that would be, you know, too kind of boastful, but I guarantee this is going to happen, right? This is a natural transition to help buyers buy and, you know, the research is suggesting and showing that, that, you know, we all kind of are bringing our consumer hats to the office more and more every day. And we want to learn on our own. We don't want to listen and start off um, with, the, with the, the sales process that was developed 20 years ago when, you know, buyers were, were technically dependent on the sales team to tell them everything. Today, I can find out information about any company, anywhere, anything, what they do, how they do, what their customers think, where they're founded, where their offices are, what value prop they have, and then I can go talk to sales after I've narrowed it down. So, so yeah, visit our website and, and give us some feedback. Let us know what you think. Love to get feedback. And are, are you still doing like most of the demos or is it like, because you mentioned that you, you want to talk to people, are you still actively doing demos? Uh, and CEOing at the same time. I'm using that as a verb. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 you know, if you go to, you know, if you listen to this podcast and then you go to our website, you're going to recognize the voice of, you know, of the recorded content. And then if you were like this example of uh, the, the, this person that called me, you know, yesterday when I built stuff for her, um, you know, we're scheduled for next week to kind of look at it in a little bit more detail. So, get, I, you know, people sometimes ask, you know, are you saying that the pre-sales engineer job is going away? And my answer is emphatically no. 
just like every other job in the world, there are certain aspects of the job that are redundant, no value add, that I'm trying to automate so that the pre-sales and the sales engineer, right, can really focus on doing the, 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 the work, the qualified leads. And, you know, poll your audience, I did, and ask them what percentage of the prospects you demo to at the top of the funnel become customers. 90% are not customers. They're kicking tires. They're in the wrong place. They just wanted to demo, right? Why don't you automate that 90% and let your pre-sales engineers focus on the real opportunities and help your company win? It doesn't, it really is a big difference if you could change your win rate by, by five or 10%. There's a lot of no decisions today, more than ever before. So if pre-sales is, more, is better engaged, more engaged, more active, I believe, right? I'm selfish and I'm biased because I think the pre-sales engineer is the most important role in the sales process. But if you can get them more engaged, um, I, I think your win rate changes. But gosh, you're sending them off on these, you know, show up and throw up kind of meetings that, that the person's never going to be a buyer. Yeah. So it's reality. I have a question about a feature that may or may not be there, but it's interesting to me. And uh, I can edit this out if uh, you want later. Um, we do a lot of WebExes with customers uh, and we record them, but then we can't use them with anybody else because there's the customer names, their questions and all that. Uh, does Omodime have a way to deal with that where it just records one, one way voice and not two way voice, anything like that? No, what our customers will do is if you have that um, in that case, um, you can uh, create a private portal for that customer so that only they hear it, right? So that's a big ask of our customers is, hey, I had a big meeting with XYZ company. Um, there was five or 10 of them on the phone. They asked a whole bunch of questions. I want to share that with them, but not the populace, right? Not the right. populace. Um, okay. You know, and I would argue that, 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 that could we do what you asked? Yes, but then you would only hear the responses, right? And, 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 and unless you could somehow you know, kind of, um, what's that, Col close caption the question and then give the answer. I think for the user, yeah. right, it, it would be difficult to just hear, like just now you hear me talking, you're like, why is Greg saying that? Because I didn't hear the question, right? So yeah. it may make it harder, but, but for, for, for private replays and for, you know, think about your buyer, they only spend 5% of their time with the sales team, 5% of the 90, 95% is when they're, they're doing their own work. So, if you record that demo with them and then share it with them in a private portal, it gives you a connection to them when they're doing their validation and consensus phase where they can go back and say, gosh, Greg said this. I don't remember exactly. Oh, let's go look. Let's go look at the demo right now. It's nine o'clock at night on a Friday night. They're thinking, you know, they're doing their, their work. Great. Right. That demo is now in front of them. You have a seat at the table. I like to say. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Actually, my question, uh, it wouldn't really work anyways, because if you're doing a demo specific to the customer, you're actually showing, well, at least for me, I'm integrating with their product as well. And they might not want to show the product to the entire world. Yep, anyways. Yep. Yeah, and it's their data, right? Because I think you're a professional, right? So you yep. always try to do your demos where it's, you know, as close to their real life scenario as possible, which is, you know, their logo, their data, their processes, maybe even married in. And yeah, yeah. you wouldn't want to share that with the world, nor would they. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> excuse me, caught a cold last week. I'm trying to, trying to get rid of it. I do, don't, I do apologize for coughing. Nope. I think it's a natural bodily function that you're allowed to do even okay. on a call. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, move on to the not so fire on. Everything's been interesting so far, but I want to ask, I ask these questions to all my guests and I want to get your take on them as well. So what's the one thing you love about doing what you're doing today? customers, people, collaboration. I just, I, I love every day I get the opportunity to meet somebody new that I haven't talked to and, and, and help them. Right. And that's, that's what I think my job is. You know, I'm selling right now. Right. But I'm helping. I, I, I believe my technology can help that business. And I, and I, I love the opportunity to tell them that. And, 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 and that's fun. That's a lot of fun. I love the word you chose there. Collaboration versus selling. Like you do sell, but you also said collaboration, which means you work with the customer versus work against the customer. People think we're two different sides, but we work together to solve a problem. So I love that. Uh, if there's any one thing you would change about your job today, what would it be? Well, I think we, we, we talked about this before. I think we went on the air and that is that in, in, in today's world, um, you know, building a team, 
um, is, is not easy. So if, if in, in my wildest dreams, and if I had a whiteboard and I could design it from perfect, everyone that works for Amadim would be in the building with me, right? Because I just think that that's energy and passion and collaboration and high fives. And I want to hear the bell ring when you get a new, you know, new customer. I want to celebrate that new person coming on board. I want to celebrate when they got their first, whatever it is they're supposed to get, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I, I've come to the reality and I face the facts that, you know, I, I need to have great people and they may not all live in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. That's, you know, probably a, 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 a fact. So um, I, I live with it. But if I had my choice, I would, uh, I would love to have everyone here with me and just, and I hope they would say the same thing. Nice. So is there a resource that you think every SE should be exposed to? Yeah, your, your, your video camera, right? So I, I, I think, you know, if you look, if you asked yourself real hard, what was the last time I videotaped myself giving a demo and watched it and listened to it? That's a resource that you should take advantage of. It's, it's, and I'll tell you, I do my demos for Amadim and I'll go back right before I publish them because they're recordings and I'll go, gosh, darn, that was terrible. Like, like not terrible in speech or I stuttered or I made a mistake and I had correct myself. That's, I actually think those should be in your recorded demos because it makes it authentic and real. And that stuff happens. Kind of what you just said, Greg, it's okay. You cough because that's natural. But, but when you, when you kind of don't stick to the point or you're rambling on about something and you, and you listen to it back and go, gosh, he asked me a simple question. I 18 minutes later, I was still talking about it. That's, you know, not right. And so I think the, the video is very useful as a, as a way to, uh, to do that. And the other resource, right. And, and, and I, and I'll say this as kind of as I can is that, you know, your, your significant other, whoever he or she may be, right. Explain to them and demo to them. And if they don't get it, there's a, there's a high probability. And my wife is my best, well, uh, best as I'm saying in a positive way, she's really hard on me because I'll demo something to her, explain. She goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why are you using all those big words? Like you're the only one that knows these words. You just made them all up and I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You're trying to impress me. And I'm like, gosh, darn it. you know, uh, no, I'm not. Goes, well, okay. I don't know what you're trying to do, but that's what you are doing. So I think, you know, go and, and, and have that conversation. And if they can't get it, then your audience may not. I mean, there's, you're selling to an organization. You, 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 that person's background may not be, you know, that you carry a technical dictionary around. And when you start using big words that are acronyms for things, they may not get it. So I think that's a great resource is the video and, and someone you trust that will be honest and, 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 you know, and you don't take it personally, right? You say, hey, this is, this is professional criticism that makes me better. That was a perfect answer. Thank you. So I think that answers the fourth question as well, which would have been, what advice would you give an SE that you don't feel they get from any, anybody? And I've never gotten that advice from anybody. So there you go. Unless right. you have something else you would advise them. No, I think there's, you know, uh, focus on, focus on a few things, not on, on, on doing, uh, you know, uh, everything good, do a couple things. Great. So I think that notion of, of, I, I'm religious about always be sharpening your ax. I, it was a sales guy at Ariba that always, he was, a, he was number one or number two every year. And every time we had a training session, every time we had any kind of set, he was the first, first one there in the front row. And one day I asked him, I said, Tom, he goes, Greg, I have to constantly be sharpening my ax. I constantly, you know, making sure that I'm doing everything I possibly can to be better at my job. And that stuck with me. That was, gosh, probably, 20 years ago, I was told that. Um, and I think that's the same for the SC. I mean, you, you, your salesperson, with all due respect, won't sit there through a 45 minute demo and listen to you and give you your critique, right? They, they're, they're in their mind, they're already thinking about what they would be saying, how they would be interrupting you during the demo with a really good, smart idea. So doing it to a video or doing it to your significant other or, or, or a good friend um, is much more beneficial. Nice. So where can people find more about you? Amadim.com. So again, that's my demo spelled backwards, O-M-E-D-Y-M.com. And please um, love to talk about pre-sales, love to talk about the demo process as a whole, love to talk about this notion of this digital buyer and how we stay connected. Um, so, uh, you know, reach out. And then I'm G Dickinson at Amadim.com. You want to send me an email and um, you can also find me on LinkedIn as well, G Dickinson. 
Perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Greg, for your time. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I hope you feel better soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. You, you're, you're doing something really, uh, really great for the community. And, I, and I, my hat's off to you. And I appreciate that uh, for all your, you know, kind of all the work you're doing. Right. This is an underserved, uh, you know, area where pre-sales doesn't always get uh, the respect uh, that they, that they deserve. And I think it's great that you're shining a light on something that can help us all. So that's why I decided to do this today with you because I, I, I love the idea. So thank, thank you. you. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we're done. That was it. I hope you guys enjoyed my chat with Greg. If you like this episode again, please leave an honest rating and review. I like the idea of Omidim as well, where you can search the video and you don't have to like, actually click literally click on the bar to move your video around and find the spot so that was interesting if you want to check it out go to amadim.com or go through the show notes which are at we the sales engineers.com slash show 67 now my biggest takeaway of the show is that even greg a ceo still has mentors he's been ceo for several companies he's been sales manager sales director and he still has mentors. And so if you're a beginner SE or a principal SE or anywhere in between, having a mentor is not a bad thing. So that's it for today. Let me know what you think of the episode. I'd love your feedback on topics you'd like me to discuss on how I can improve the podcast. If I stutter, if I talk too fast, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'd love to hear those. So let me know. And if there are any people you think I should have on the podcast, please let me know. Actually, here's another thing. If there are any podcasts that you think I should be on, hit me up on Twitter, We The the SEs, and let me know which podcast you think I would add value to their listeners. And that's it. Thank you guys for listening and spending your time with me. I really appreciate it. With that, this is Ramsey signing off.